Have you ever wondered, can you communicate directly with spirit guides, teachers, or non-physical consciousness, or even our higher selves? What would they tell us? My name is Kevin Moore, and since 2015, I started to practice a form of communication which is termed channeling. I have been interviewing experts on my talk show to find out, does life continue after we die? and can we communicate with those that have crossed over? With each expert I spoke to, they all had different ideas. Is there knowledge from the past which could be shared with the present moment? So I thought, why not just speak to the non-physical world directly through channelers around the world? And that's what I set out to do. They call us channelers, we'll take the viewers on a journey into the phenomena known as channeling. And my main goal with this docu-series is to bring a new understanding and awareness to channeling by looking within ourselves and asking, is it truly possible that we can all use this innate ability? Well, Marcus and Sheila, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. It's really nice to meet you and be with you. Thank you very much. It's great, it's great to be with you both, it really is. And, and thank you, Sheila, as well, for taking the, the, the... I know it's taken a lot out on you right now to do this, right? But thank you for persevering and making this happen as well. So that's appreciated. It's my pleasure and privilege to be able to, sh to share with you. So thanks for having us. Well, thank you very much. So. I think I'm going to start with yourself to begin with, Sheila, mm -hmm. because I think this all started for you, this journey, when you had a near-death experience. Yes, it did. I had a near-death experience 49 years ago, and it was after the birth of a child. I had pulmonary embolus, which is your blood clots go into your lungs and break the blood vessels, and then you ultimately drowned. And my lungs were non-functional. They were full of fluid. And I was in intensive care. And I just kept saying, hey, God, give me a job. I'll do anything. Um, and I just laid there thinking that, repeating it over and over again. And then the room, the cubicle in the intensive care room, became extremely bright, as if the sun had risen in the room itself. And I saw movement at the end of my bed. And when I focused on it, Jesus was standing at the end of my bed. Well, you can imagine. I was like, oh, <laughs> this is interesting. And I was just mesmerized by his eyes. Beautiful hazel eyes. He had short hair. All the pictures I had seen were long hair, <laughs> but short auburn hair. And just this beautiful face, but kind, kind eyes. And so as he looked at me, he took his arms and crossed them underneath his the sleeves of the garment he had on. When he did so, I heard in my inner mind hearing, like we hear our own thoughts, I heard a distinct male voice say to me, remember my child, you are loved. And at that point, I felt as if the top of my crown had opened up and this warmth started pouring through me. And when it th went through the trunk of my body, because I felt like I had an elephant sitting on my chest, I couldn't breathe, I felt as if I could take a deep breath. And this was just seconds, but as I talk to you about it now, it's just as real to me as if it just happened. And <clears throat> then I started getting better. And um, the doctors were amazed because they were preparing my family that I wouldn't live through the day. And um, a month, I was in the hospital for a month. And when I got out of the hospital, about Six months out, I started having all kinds of psychic phenomena happening to me internally and externally. I could do automatic writing. I could move objects with my mind. I could hear clairaudiently like we hear our mind, like I heard Jesus' voice with messages that were being given. And then I tranced spontaneously and became what was called then a direct voice trance medium. 
the word channeling wasn't even coined then as, as part of this work. So this work started happening through me and here we are today. And just going, thank you so much for sharing that, by the way, that's fantastic. And just going back to the near death experience, that time that you had that out of body experience, you know, we call it seconds maybe, right? Mm -hmm. But that could have been a lot longer in another reality. It was reality. out of time. It was, re you know, I don't know the kind of time. And it didn't feel out of body. It was just, you know, the bright light. It, it's just as real to me as us sitting here having the conversation. Now that feeling of love that you got uh, when that experience was unfolding, um, what did that love feel like? And through your channeling, have you felt the same level of love, the same energy of that, that love that was present at that near-death experience? Well, it's indescribable, really. I don't think our vocabulary has words that could properly describe it. It was... Um, it was unconditional love just permeating every cell in my body, really. And and have I had that? Um, periodically, yes, I have, which is delicious. It's really lovely to have that sense of just being in this place of total protection and love. It's beautiful. So, uh, you know, your, your fear of death from, from having the near-death experience, but also being a channeler as well, it must be, you must be coming from a different perspective with that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Marcus and I have done some work with hospice and I've been there when my parents have passed. And, and so there's this whole sense of awareness and presence in being there, it's not fearful at all. And if you don't mind me asking, when, when, when you've been around people that have passed, do you, do, you, do you feel their energy leaving their body? Yes. Yeah. They've even weighed it, haven't they, and done experiments where the bodies had seemed lighter at the, at the point of death. Yes. Yeah. And even smaller, looking smaller, that's what I noticed, is, you know, when, when we're with people who are alive, there's a certain energy presence in their size. And uh, when they're not there anymore, the body seems much smaller. That's what I have noticed that. Do you think... It feels like it anyway. It, yeah, it feels yeah. like that, yeah. 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 Do you think that the near-death experience was the only way for you to have your awakened experience in a sense? You know, I'm not quite sure. I had, you know, I, I believed that every, well, everybody is psychic. I had some prophetic dreams as a child. Uh, I lived in a family that believed that we, we did have extrasensory experiences, so that was supported, but nothing to do the, to the degree that happened after my near-death experience. Um, but I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I can't answer that yes or no, because I'm really, I don't know for sure. Because many people that have had near-death experiences, you know, yours is a very different path, and, and um, a special path, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. Not chosen by many, <laughs> because it's, it's so life-changing what you've been through. Well, I've often said to people, had God, when I kept saying, give me a job, give, given me a roster of, of positions that I could have taken, I don't know that this would have been one of them. Because this started in 1969 for me, which this wasn't even spoken about openly. Absolutely. You, you would have probably put it in the waste paper bin, had <laughs> you known, right? Um, but that's a very good point. 1969. So you never talked about the near-death experience until many years later. It was a, several years later. That I, that I spoke about it, um, just because I, it was so extraordinary that I, and I didn't think anybody would believe me. But you had no one to share it with. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. What sort of changes were you going through then, uh, past the near-death experience and sort of moving on to becoming a, a channeler? Oh my gosh, it was all spontaneous. Things started happening very rapidly. Like I said, I could do automatic writing. I, I got writing about the Watergate issue two years before it was ever, uh, we were ever told that that was even going on. 
And 16 years later, that was validated by one of the participants, John Ehrlichman. He validated everything that I had gotten, which was quite interesting. But these kinds of things were happening. I was getting all this stuff about the government and, you know, and spirit saying, you better tell, these are my words, tell the president to knock it off. That, those are my words. And I'm going, yeah, right, I'm going to go <laughs> and do that. But it was profound. And then I would know things about people in my community that I, that I really didn't know them that well. Maybe I'd met them once or twice. Um, and just different things. When, when the angels or the spirit wanted to talk to me, I would be sitting in a chair and it would be like someone your size or Marcus's size shaking it to say, we want to talk to you now. I had to learn to say, this is my life and this is the criteria. We'll talk at 10 on Monday. <laughs> and, you know, and they told me to do that. I mean, they instructed me how to handle this, this work instead of just letting it happen in the middle of the night. I had my bed levitate in the middle of the night. I mean, I had a lot of phenomena that was happening through me and to me externally. But always in a loving way. Always, always. It was never uh, malevolent at all. It was always loving, just teaching me because I didn't have anybody that I knew or talked to about, oh my gosh, did this happen to you? Did that happen to you? Because um, I did get a book, an Edgar Casey book, because there were very few books out that then talked about, because I was laying down like he was when this voice started coming through and I was in trance. And so that gave me some insight about what was happening to me. But it was really spirit that was teaching me and assisting me. And then I did have a very good friend um, that then would assist me. And then scientists found out about me. I don't know how. I was living in the mountains in Colorado with three little kids and invited me to go to a conference on psychics and scientists. It was put on by the University of Miami, which I met several physicists that were researching psychic phenomena, and I was tested by them. And what that did for me... Um, was it kind of gave me the good housekeeping seal of approval. You're not crazy, you're psychic. Because back in that time, I didn't have anybody to really speak to about it. Uh, that, that's just so incredible. And, and I'm, I really appreciate you sharing this because it's gonna help so many people who will be going through something even similar nowadays in mm -hmm. some respects, especially sure. when they come from a religious background. Oh, right? definitely, yes. So, so, okay, so your new life was kind of forming, but what was happening to your old life with your family? Was that kind of disintegrating at the time? Well, like I said, I had this brand new baby and I had two little children at home. And that was my thing. I was going to be a mom and I, you know, we were living in the mountains of Colorado and it was terrifying for my husband at the time because here he'd all, almost lost me. You know, I almost died. There's a brand new baby that was premature. I mean, it, he had a lot on his plate. And then all this crazy weird stuff started happening to his wife that um, it, was, it was shocking. So just remind us, when did the channeling start? How did the channeling start? It first started through automatic writing. And then that progressed almost immediately. Uh, well, then I had the clear audience. I could hear the messages. And then I was doing automatic writing um, because Spirit had told me some, a lady in my town to contact her. I didn't even know who it was. They gave me a name. I didn't know what was going on. And I called her up. And it turned out that she was a county health nurse. And there was this little pocket of people interested in parapsychology and metaphysics. And I called her and said, this is what's happening to me. And she said, I'll be right over. And she brought another woman with her who happened to be in their little group. And she said, well, show me what's happening. And I started doing the automatic writing and I tranced spontaneously and the writing kept going and it was four hours. 
And when I came back, she was holding my hands and she was calling my name. And I didn't know it had been that long. And what I was told is my whole face changed. I became someone else when that was happening. And then from that point, I was laying down and, and um, I was doing, um, what was that? I, I was laying down and then it became a direct voice. Did you channeling. ever, thank you. Did you ever challenge it? Did you, were you ever like, you know, can this be real? You know, am, 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 am I losing my mind? Well, there were moments that I thought that, but I was having so many confirmations that were begin, being given me through the information that was coming that I trusted it. But the other thing is, is I made that commitment. What kept me going, it was my commitment to God to stay alive. And I just, and deep down, you know, in that place in our gut that's no doubt, that no doubtedness, that everything was fine, even though it was unusual, extraordinary actually, and a little off-putting, there was nothing that was um, so off-putting that I, that I would just stop. It, you know, it was just different. I'd never, um, when I did the first automatic writing I got was from my grandmother. And it was, and it was so interesting really, Kevin, because I was a Brownie Scout leader for my oldest daughter. And the lady that was helping me invited me to her house one morning and we were having coffee and she said, have you ever heard about automatic writing? Now this is 1969. I said, no, what's that? And she described it to me. And she said, you want to try it? And I said, sure. Not even thinking about, this was nine months after my near-death experience. And I said, sure. And I tried it. She said, well, you just sit with a piece of paper and a pen really lightly and you just ask somebody that's dead to talk to you. <laughs> and I said, I'm a gamer, you know, I'll try. And I held the pen and I said, okay, I'm going to ask my grandmother. And the room got really cold. And I was sitting on a bar stool at a breakfast bar like this. And <laughs> I was sitting there and I was holding, you know, my analog political self, just holding it enough to keep it upright. I felt this energy come down my arm, take over my arm, and the pin started moving. And she, uh, she said, yes, I'm here. Can you feel me? And it was like, I dropped the pin. My teeth were chattering. My knees were knocking. I got down off the stool, walked across, sat down on the sofa, and just had to deep breathe for a few minutes. And then I thought, I gotta try that again. And I got up and I went back to the stool and I asked her if she had a message for me. And she gave the message, where are my white flowers? That was it. But it was amazing because it what I knew it was my energy moving that pin. I could feel her energy. It's when the chair moved. It was, uh, so I had to call my mother. And I said, hey mom, grandma's talking to me. And she said, oh, really? <laughs> and she wants to know where her fl white flowers are. And she, my mother knew immediately what she was talking about. It was a flower bed. They had sold the property and building. They had condominiums had been built on it. But she had had a, a, her favorite flower bed had Easter lilies in it with red roses around it. And that's what she was talking about. My mother knew immediately. So that was the first time. And that's a great story. Thank you for sharing that because later on, I'm just going to, before we wrap this up, I'm just going to go back to that story for a reason. There's a okay. reason you brought that up as well. Thank you. So just moving the story forward then. So um, obviously at a point you met Marcus, mm -hmm. um, but just before that point, what, what, what built up to that? What was going on in your life at the time for others who are probably going through a similar path as well? Oh gosh, just before Marcus and I met, um, my daughter, who was born at the time of my near-death experience, um, was injured and almost died. And so I had stopped working, stopped working with clients, and I was just in the process of selling another book, and I just stopped that. 
and took care of her for about 10 months until she was well. And so um, I had just gotten back, back to working again, and I was invited to give a talk in Phoenix, Arizona. And I had told my daughter, I'm ready to get my, my life back. She said, well, go get your life back, just like that. Well, then I went to Phoenix, Arizona, and a mutual friend, of Marcus and I, had knew I was coming and said, I have somebody I want you to meet. And I, I went to Phoenix, and we met the night before the talk just to have a glass of wine, and Marcus was the friend she wanted me to meet. So... Beautiful. I got a life back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Marcus, um, your spiritual search as well prior to meeting together, I mean, what, what was going on in your sort of uh, background there as well? Were you, were you on a spiritual quest or, or were you looking at the understanding of what consciousness is? Well, when I met her, I was very definitely on a spiritual path. Yeah. Um, real, I'll give you the quick backstory of my kind of evolution and arriving at this point here. Um, my the first spiritual experiences I ever had, or the first, uh, you know, moments of inquiry for me, revolved around having out of body experiences when I was when I was a 13, 14 year old kid, and because I was raised Catholic, I was raised in a belief system that believed in evil and the devil and Satan, and you know this was my belief system at the time. So as I'm in a state of night paralysis or the vibrational state where you can't move your physical body, you know, you're you're awake. You can't move the physical body. Frightened, it was, it was well. It was so scary that I would dread going to bed at night because I knew this state was going to come on. I would sometimes end up on the on the side. I would end up on the floor. My, I was out of my body, and I was tr I was holding on so tight to losing control because I thought I was going to lose control or be taken over. And this uh, finally, it's, it passed, but it kind of shut me down. I think is the best way of putting it. And I literally shut down for about 20 years. And I didn't, I, I stopped going to church. None of that stuff was making any sense to me anymore. So around 15, my mom finally, you know, she was great. She said, all right, if you don't want to go to church, you don't have to go to church. Um, fast forward to when I was 23. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling you the story, but when I was 23, I actually was invited to be my father's sponsor into the Catholic Church. Uh, now, the joke in the family was it was the blind leading the blind, of course, you know, and, and, and that was kind of an ironic, fun moment for me. And then, you know, life, life goes on. And then in my mid-30s, with a number of life changes, is when I woke up again. And I really started exploring. And uh, we were talking earlier about near-death experiences and Raymond Moody and, and uh, all the research that had been, you know. So, so my quest, uh, Kevin, was simply wanted to know why was I here? You know, who, who am I? Why was I here? And where am I going? I mean, those are the three questions that I was asking myself. And I dove in. So about uh, five years after I dove in, and I mean, to the exclusion of a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, other areas of interest in my life. I mean, I was really on a path, and I can't remember a moment that triggered the path, but there was a moment in my mid-30s where everything just kind of, you know, my, my interest changed and the way I spend my time changed. I began meditating again, because I'd learned to meditate when I was 18 in uh, Transcendental Meditation, so I started meditating again. And it just unfolded. And then I met a woman, literally, in a grocery store, two years before Sheila came to town. Uh, it was a very, um, uh, you know, there was nothing significant. It was a very insignificant feeling meeting at the time, other than the fact that I was compelled to give her my business card in the parking lot of a grocery store after having just said hi in the checkout line. And it wasn't a romantic thing at all. I had no idea why I was doing this. Gave her my card. She called me. Uh, about a week later, she just moved to Scottsdale, Arizona, and it turned out that a buddy of mine was coming into town that night. Uh, three of us got together for dinner. They ended up living together for four years. She gave me Sheila's first book, The Fifth Dimension, Channels to a New Reality. So you can see how the story's coming together, right? Um, and, and that was, um, that was, so I read the book and I loved the book. The Fifth Dimension was you know those books, Kevin, where you just, you, that book jumps off the shelf at you when you need to read exactly what's in that particular book. And that was what happened with the fifth dimension for me. So we became good friends, her friend and I, and my friend, of course, was dating her. And she said, hey, she was coming to town. You want to meet her? You know, she's going to do a speaking engagement. And I said, yeah, I'd love to do that. You know, so we met at the Phoenician Resort. And uh, we 
through a series of interesting kind of synchronicities, a lot of really interesting things were happening in both of our lives to, for us to come together about a month later. And we went down into the Havasupai Indian Reservation down the bottom of the Grand Canyon. And we were able to participate because our, our, we had friends who were good friends with the medicine men down there. So we were able to participate in their ceremonies and sweat lodges and hang out with them for five days. Uh, and so we went on a camping trip for our first date and for five days. And uh, when we came out, uh, and I'll finish the story with this, when we came out, we had a, a group of people uh, in my home, about 25, 30 people came over to meet Sheila and meet Theo, because I'd never met Theo before. Uh, because when I met her, I kind of came out of the metaphysical closet. I could no longer hide my spirituality, hide the experiences that I was having, because I was probably still attached to what people thought. Because my world was a pretty linear, 3D, you know, you know, world. It wasn't a five-dimensional world quite at that point, you know. And uh, so we, after everybody left, and we went outside, and we had a really beautiful backyard, and we walked out and back and sat down. And, and I said to her, well, this has certainly been interesting. What are we going to do on our second date? You know, she said, I don't date. So I said, all right, let's get it's married. And, and, and so we made a decision that, that mm -hmm. night for her to move. I had a nine-year-old daughter. And, uh, you know, at the time, and, and the, there was probably a hundred reasons why it wasn't convenient for us to be together. For either one of us. For either one of us. She's up in Fort Collins, Colorado, and has a whole life going on. And, and so it was, it was pretty, a lot of family. And so it was interesting. And so we just knew we had to be together. Um, let's just talk about when Theo came to you and who was there before knocking on the door. Okay. The first spokesman that came through me was Orlos. And... Orlos told me that they, he, however we want to speak of it, was preparing me for higher teachers to come through. And very soft-spoken and very loving, unconditional loving. And just kind and, and the softness. And um, then about two years, a little over two years, I was doing a group in Seattle. And Orlo said, it's time for us to depart. The higher teachers are here. And in that group, Theo came in and it was amazing, loud, very computer-like sounding. In fact, I came out of the trance and people were saying, it, is your throat sore? Because going from Orlos, very soft-spoken, to this big, big, huge voice where the windows almost shook, um, and giving this, this direction. And at that point, I had this sensation in my body that, you know, like when you hit your elbow and that tingling feeling that you get from it, it's uncomfortable. I had that going on in my neck, my upper head, everything when they took over. And it was an internal thing, a nervous system thing. It was so uncomfortable. And for about a week when they would come in, I would have that same energy in my body. And I, I said, if this is going to continue, I can't do this. It's too uncomfortable. And they said, no, no, no. We're just balancing out your cells with our vibration so that it can blend. And it, it was about five days, probably. Was there any point in your journey, I'm guessing, that, you know, doing this for many years, traveling as well, I'm guessing it was a lot of fun. Um, you knew you were helping a lot of people. You were doing your part to serve as well. It felt very loving. But was there a part where you was like, I don't want to do this by myself anymore? Oh, sure. And there would be moments where I would be tired and, you know, and maybe having a, a particularly um, not easy client. Um, I would think, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, it was great when it was really helping people. But if you'd have that one person that was just difficult, not so great. Um, and then I, you know, then I get a phone call from somebody telling me, how much their life had changed, how much help it had been to them. And then it was like, okay, one more day, one more day. But like I told you before, what kept me on path, because there were many times I could have quit and thought about it. 
because there were early on, it, you know, this wasn't something I went into social situations and went, ta-da, guess what I can do? Because it wasn't accepted. Right. It wasn't accepted. So I had to learn how to navigate when people said, well, what do you do? <laughs> to see if I could tell them fully what I did. You know, how I would do it is I would say, oh, I'm, um, I'm involved in metaphysics and parapsychology. If they knew what those words meant, game on. If they didn't, it was just like their eyes would glass over, go over their head, and they'd change the subject. So I had to navigate who I could talk to. Um, but just stayed on course because I made the commitment to be here. But then I'd have those moments that were extraordinary with the messages. Every time Theo speaks, I learn something new. And it's got, and every time it expands. And it depends on the group, of course. It depends on the questions. As Marcus says, we're only limited by our intelligence and curiosity. And so if there are people that are intelligent and curious and they're asking really great questions it's amazing so that keeps me going too because i've i've learned so much and i i'm continuing to learn all the time absolutely and, and just be, just before we move on just with, with that trance channeling um after interviewing you know 70 something channelers it, it's a rarity it's a rare thing and um it's a special thing and it's not, I don't know if it's something you can teach. It seems to be something that's, you either can do or you can't. I don't know. What's your, your take on it? You know, I, in, I encourage people. I share my experience with them. But I, I think it is something that you have to be available to. A lot of people say, I want to do what you do, that have no idea what it takes to do what I do, because it, it looks easy. But what it takes on your physicality, on your physical body, and the energy that it takes. Um, you know, I've, I've had this evolution now of almost 50 years. So it's very comfortable for me, and the energy blends. And um, so, it, as I said in the beginning, I had all these things happening that were extraordinary. Um, but I don't know that you, you have to be available to it. I don't know that you can teach it unless somebody's, and, and really the teaching is just letting somebody know they're okay. That's the biggest thing. Yeah. Sheila, Sheila has a reputation though. I, 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 would, I would differ with your answer just in one respect. I, I think that, because I've observed this for 20 years now, I've observed Sheila and Theo teaching people how to feel safe, like you said, Yeah how to make themselves open and receptive, how to change their thinking and their beliefs so that they're, so they are open and receptive without fear or resistance. So I do think there's a teaching in this. I mean, when you and, when you and Theo uh, were mentors and catalysts for Esther Hicks to open up to mm -hmm. Channeling Abraham back in 1984, if Esther hadn't had the opportunity to come to you, she may very well have found somebody else. But the two of you, the 13 of you, I guess we should mm -hmm. say, you know, were very instrumental, at least how, she, how Esther mm -hmm. tells the story about, you know, them, assisting in, in, in her opening up. And, th and since then, of course, since I've been working with you, I've noticed you know hundreds and hundreds of people have come through our various mentoring programs and live events and retreats and so forth who have been uh, guided by Theo, who have asked specific questions of Theo. How can I become more open and receptive to, to receiving guidance? So I think that uh, the answer to that is both, I think. Well, let me just ask you, are, are you still sort of friends with Esther? We're friends, well, yeah. We're fr I would say we're friends. Do we interact? No, she's very insular um, and very contained and, and has been when Jerry was living as well. Um, but I know I could call her and we'd have a great conversation. It's just our lives are certainly on, on our own track. Absolutely, absolutely. So if I was to ask you both then, um, what is channeling to you nowadays? And if you want to answer that individually, because obviously I'm guessing the answer over the years has evolved, or maybe it hasn't. Um, well, see, I think all of us are channels in whatever way is psychologically and emotionally comfortable for us. Um, giving your body over to allow the information to come through like I do. Um, 
as you said, is rare. But we all channel in whatever way. You know, writers, um, musicians, artists, they're all channeling in, in that way that the information comes through them or, or the piece of art comes through them. I mean, in your own experience, you are a channel in the work that you do. And in many ways, you know, that's the time we're living in now. And I've known that from the beginning, that if I could do this, every, everybody could do this. Um, and we're meant to do it in, in those ways that we, we can. And it will develop over a period of time as we're comfortable with it, as it did with me. I think, I think the answer to that evolves from our own personal experience, because for me it's changed. You know, when I first met Sheila, I thought that channeling was for somebody, I was not even considering the possibility myself personally of, of having, even though I'd had a lot of experiences, I think people, you know, they start thinking, you know, at the beginning of their, of their journey that it's for somebody else, and then through their own personal experience, they begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm having experiences. It may not be someone's, you know, angel speaking through my physical body like it, like it does for Sheila, but we have clairvoyant experiences, we have out-of-body experiences, we have experiences of clear guidance, we have, and I've had angelic, you know, I've had conversations where I could hear with my physical ears angels, for instance. So there's just different experiences that you begin to have and go, wow, I, wow, I can do this too, you know, and that's at the core of our work with people and we do a spiritual and psychic exploration program. Uh, on live and retreats as well, and we and we actually put people in a position to have their own personal experiences with Theo's guidance. So that's why I say it can be going back yeah. to it being it, it can be taught I think to that degree, and then all of a sudden you realize, hey, yeah, I can do this too, even though it's not the same expression. In this work, when it comes to discernment, like any field, um, one thing I've learned on this journey, I thought I thought after interviewing nearly eight hundred people. On, on my YouTube channel, I thought I thought I had had a grip on it, but I didn't. And and what that is is that spiritual teachers who aren't living their truth, and discernment as well. So, when it comes to discernment, how how do you guys? What would you guys say to that? Oh, I think we all have to be discerning about anybody we work with and anything we believe in. I mean, um, we all have a barometer in us of truth. And, and we have to pay attention to that and not give our power away. Just because somebody says that they can channel Harry, let's say, well, maybe Harry's a disincarnate and maybe it's not that great with information. I mean, you just, you have to be able to discern what you're receiving, what you're feeling inside. How does that feel? Does it feel like your truth? Does it feel good to you? Or is it something that validates some, some of your core beliefs? I think it, the discernment's in the individual, and it's really, really important because this, this has been a field that has been um, abused. Well, the body's, the body's the greatest receptor of all. You know, clairsentience mm -hmm. and claircognizance, where you're, you feel a feeling, you know it's, we, it, f truth is a feeling. Really, you, you feel, you know truth, you feel truth. And we, and Theo is always encouraging people to be very, very discerning and to look at when you're reading or experiencing or, you know, studying, whatever it might be, um, is there, did you feel this way when you read this from somebody else and now you're reading it again and, it, oh yeah, that's, that really feels right. Now you're, you're getting confirmation, but the confirmation is within you as you read different sources of the same information. Hmm, it feels true. And then, oh, that feels true, that feels true. And so I think there's this uh, sense of, of um, like you say, it is all about discernment. But we have that inner, we call it the BS barometer, you know, that we all have it. Well, and I think it's, a, what's I really love that's happening now is, is the consistency of the message. Yeah. That the messengers that are coming through now that, I, in my discernment, are in truth, are the ones that are consistent. The words might be different, but the message has a consistency in it for us all. Then I, I trust that. It's if it's very divergent, that would be questionable to me. And, and to our conversation earlier, Kevin, if it's fear-based, if 
it's fear-based, if it's sensational, if, is it, if it, is it um, conspiracy-oriented and so forth. We tend not to pay a lot of attention or put a lot of time into in reading or experiencing those. If it up-levels the person, yeah. it's all, to me, it's all about living our life in a better way. Absolutely, and we're just going to wrap up here just very, very shortly. Thank, thank you for that, absolutely. And just going back to the point where, you know, you, where you, you initially started doing the creative writing, and, you know, we, when you asked for your grandmother to come through, for example, um, you know, when we, when we channel someone like our grandmother or, or our, our loved ones, I always felt that when they've crossed over, that's just a word for this phenomena. It might be something very different, but when they've moved into another space, that they would all of a sudden be all knowing, you know, they would be downloaded back to what their original form may have been, and they may have seen a bigger picture, you know, let's watch this movie, and it's going to tell you all about where you really came from and who you were, like, like a total recall, right? Uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Just because Auntie Ethel you know, uh, she, she wasn't very good at relationships and in, 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 in advice in this realm, does that mean that she'd be able to give good advice uh, on the other side? Sure, sure. Again, discernment, you know, and I always knew my grandmother was around me. I could feel her, even when I was young. I was 15 when she passed. Um, but that she would be the one to come through as in this opening was... I could allow that, you know, because we had such a loving connection um, that was the step into to the next level. And, and, and to your question about the knowing when we leave and move into the, our multidimensional uh, nature, you know, our, our being, um, they do say we, we do reconnect with, this, with the full knowledge of our of our higher self, which would be all the Akashic records as some people describe it. So there is a knowing that we, we move back into that, but there's also discarnate energies or, or souls that don't move into the higher frequencies, which people call ghosts or whatever you want to def refer to them as, who do interact on the lower levels of the astral plane. And I think that uh, that's where information gets a little murky, perhaps. It's a good, good line of question for Theo, by maybe, the way. It gets a little forward. distorted, yeah. Uh, so there is the, the what, we, what we know about the homecoming or the reunion back into the full self is that there is a, 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 a and we don't have the, the pictures or the remembrance yet to know what this really looks like or feels like, but, but there is a, a, an awareness of the full knowledge of the soul. I think as an example to couples coming together, I call them power couples in this field, coming together to, to push to pull this work forward. I, I think had you had not come together, I wonder where the work would have gone. I wonder. You know, um, I'm not certain, but I always knew that I would have a partner, a male partner to do the work. And um, when, when my children's father and I parted, and that just wasn't working out for him to be available to do that, um, I still had the feeling that, uh, that I would have a partner. But then before I met Marcus, I had come, I was coming to the decision that well, maybe I was wrong. You know, maybe that feeling, that knowing was incorrect. And then Marcus showed up and there was no doubt that we were supposed to do this together. Absolutely no doubt. Yeah. Oh, I, I totally agree, yeah. Mm. yeah. And, and it's just evolved the work. And, and just, just to clarify, Theo, Theo is a collection. Just, just tell us about Theo just very briefly. Well, as Theo told me when they first came through that time in Seattle, they said, we will be known as Theo. We were 12 archangels. We will not identify singularly because there would be too much attention paid to the speaker and not the message. So they've never identified individually. And then they told me to look up the, the, na the word Theo in the dictionary, and, which I did. And it, and it is the beginning or God. And, but I have to tell you this, 
for five years, I kept thinking, they come, when they come in, as you will experience, they always say, this is the beginning, is it not? I kept thinking, why aren't they just saying, hello, this is Theo. Five years into this deal, I'm realizing that's exactly what they're saying. They're saying, this is the beginning, is it not? And that's the description, the first description in the dictionary for Theo. Also, you could say as well, this is the only moment we've got, the present moment. Yes. Yeah, yes. That's another way of looking at it. But that's incredible. Oh, so many questions I wanted to ask you. And I know we've just kind of, you know, we've got, we've got human restrictions here right now of your time as well. Um, oh, let's just me ask this as well. With the courses that you're doing now, just mm -hmm. tell us about where the work has gone and what the emphasis on the work is now. It's, oh, the work has just exploded. It's really expanding. We have several mentoring classes that um, are based around uh, Theo's work called soul integration, which is the fragmented aspects of the soul that influence the, the beliefs of our not enoughnesses, the beliefs that we hold about ourselves that keep us from living the life we want to live and being the person we want to be. And that comes from different times and situations and circumstances for survival sake, where we adopt beliefs about ourselves to survive in the environment that we're in, whether it's a family or an um, educational system or a religious system or wherever it is that an external event happens that we then believe about ourselves, whatever it is, in a negative sense, that we're not good enough and not worthy that keeps us from being all we can be. And so the first mentoring program we started was called Thrive, which is all about having the tools of soul integration. And then we created another program that was the second leg up of that, which is the Accelerator, which is an envisioning program that's six months long that allows people to take those tools, release the limiting beliefs, and move into creating the life that they want to have. And then we, we, have, and we have two live retreats that are mm -hmm. a part of that program. We have retreats. Too. And then as Marcus said, we have the Psychic and Spiritual Exploration program that's a 12-week online class as well as a retreat, which is really fun because that's when we work with people to, for them to rec recognize all of their intuitive gifts and to really have the experiences with them that validate that. And then we have a certification program for those who wish to use the tools of soul integration in the work they do in the world. We also have a couple 12-month programs too. So we have two year-long programs. Uh, one's called Premier Master Coaching, which if you want to really take an into, get into an intimate uh, mastermind, an elite mastermind with Sheila and Theo, myself, and, and uh, we limit that to a very intimate group as we do uh, what's called a Soul Integration Facilitator Mastermind, which is another group that comes together who are all certified to be able to teach and, and to facilitate for others. So that's, um, those are kind of our, our two 12-month programs that we have. And, and the last program we have, which, which is in development, although we do have a live retreat right now, is called The Art of Relationship. And it's, it's Theo's observations, angelic observations, on this human experience that we're having and how to begin with the relationship with the self and loving the self so that we can have these incredible relationships in every aspect of our lives. So that's a, a book and an online training program we're creating right now and also a live retreat that we began last fall called The Art of Relationship. And it was, it was remarkable to see what was going on with that, the transformation that took place. Yeah. So, you know, what my question is, what I feel like to ask you is that obviously there's three people in this relationship. There's yourselves and there's mm -hmm. Theo. Mm -hmm. What's that like as a couple? Or do, have you ever, does it ever interfere or do, is it ever a strange thing to have a third person in the relationship? Well, we have 14. <laughs> there are 12 <laughs> There's 12 and, and then us two, and us. us two little humans here. Yeah, we have, we have 14 of us. <laughs> That's a great question. No, it's not uncomfortable at all. I mean, you know, we have an extraordinary job. We have an extraordinary job in what we do, but we have a normal life for us. We, we live a normal life. We have children, we have grandchildren, uh, we travel, we have good friends, um, and, we, and we love what we do. But how, just, how do your kids and the, the, their further family feel about the work that you do? Well, 
they totally agree with it. Um, my two daughters, my older daughter and my younger daughter, who I say this is her fault because she was the one that was born at the time, um, work in our company. And they're very... We think, we think uh, we've got their approval. <laughs> <laughs> that's beautiful. We're not that sure, but we, we, we no, think... That's great to have a family business. I really like that. That's mm -hmm. that. You must be so grateful that that's turned out oh, that way. Oh, absolutely. It's wonderful to have them. Because I've got others that I'm going to meet. For example, Lee Carroll, who's going to be very honest, that actually they all walked away from him. And others this happened to as well. Mm -hmm. Well, it was difficult for their father, my children's father. Um, but... Uh, the children grew up with it, you know. In fact, my youngest daughter thought everybody's mother was a medium until she found out, no, that didn't happen. You know, because when you grow up in a house, you know, my, my kids grew up with, with Theo in their lives. And, and it was really funny one time when my son was in high school, he invited a friend over for dinner and I was working in my office and then, and then this young man had dinner with us. And then his mother made an appointment with me. And she was sitting at her dinner table with her family. And she said, oh, I'm going to go have a session with Theo tomorrow. And her son pops up and goes, Theo, oh, I know Theo. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> so it was just part of our lives. Um, but let's be clear. We, I know we've got family and certainly some friends that think we're completely bonkers crazy. You know, they have to. Well, you do. I do. Well, I, think, I think you do, too. Well, a little yeah, bit. probably. Yeah, if, you think, if, we're, if we're being really honest, I think that's probably. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I appreciate you sharing that as well. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, okay, well, let me just say this. <laughs> Hello. Let me just say this. Well, Sheila and Marcus, just thank you so, so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Oh, it's been a treat. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Kevin. It is the beginning, is it not? We are appreciative of the opportunity to be of service unto you. You may ask? Yes, many questions, right. I, I first want to ask, did you help to arrange this interview as well? We were instrumental, yes. Why, why did you feel you wanted to come on to this documentary? It is the truth to be told. And that is your mission, isn't it? I'm trying to make it that. Yes. And we know that to be true. For it is your desire that this is something that is a reality in this time of fifth dimensionary energy that is to evolve the consciousness of the human being. And it is important not to be feared, but to be embraced. Do you know, today I was on my knees having a bit of a cheeky cigarette, right? <laughs> and I was just, I realized the impact that I've almost done this documentary. I haven't realized that until this morning, not in, not in the 190 days. It was, it was almost like, wow, what have I just gone and done? But you were inspired to do so. We would say driven. Your guidance has been moving you forward to bring this forth as the teacher that you are. Absolutely, and I know I've been working with a group as well. I call it The One, but it's just my name for it. Yes. And I feel that they've been driving me to, to even to this point now, to be in front of you. That is true. And there were times you, you would have stopped, yes? Yes. Yes. But you moved forward because you know the truth of it. I've probably taken about 50 years of my body <laughs> doing it. But yeah, um, I knew the truth and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to have you here. So if there was one message you would like to give right now, what would that important message be? 
It is important for those who are on this planet who have incarnated by choice here in their human experience that they have chosen to do so for this tremendous opportunity of shifting consciousness for all human beings, the human species on this planet, for you one species. And it is not a nationalist thing, it is a globalist thing that the species comes together to support each other and the planet itself. So it's of import in this time to recognize the fifth dimensionary energy is a, a time that is a higher vibrational rate for all to recognize their divinity and mastery. And in doing so, there can be created peace on your planet. But what about for those who in this lifetime never wake up? So for example, my truth on that, to begin on this journey was, well, maybe they're not meant to, maybe they're affecting the people around them to see the opposite of the person who's not waking up. That's correct. It's the contrast, isn't it? Yeah, but then my thinking's changed a little bit to thinking, well, yes, it's the contrast, but then what if it's important for that soul to wake up? So they have the ability now with the energy presently that they can. And that's why they've chosen to incarnate now. And for those who are not to be a part of this energy, and you've noticed this are, as well, are leaving the planet. Yes. Oh, or yes. not coming at all. Or not coming back. Correct. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that sends goosebumps down me right now, just, just you know, that, that, that acknowledgement. Uh, definitely. But there's also a lot of spiritual teachers with high followings in, in, in this reality that we're in right now and that are not living by their truth as well. Now I feel very, you know, is, you know, is that, should I be saying these things? But it's what I've observed. And I'm thinking, well, how helpful is that for them and for the people that follows them? Understand this. Beings are drawn to the teacher. Yes? Yes. For whatever reason, they're drawn there for their own experience and awareness. So your observation of that is good, but it is for them to discern, isn't it? Yes. What is the truth? Absolutely, because for me to start waving my arms and saying what's right or wrong is just as much. It's a judgment, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. The difference of judgment an observation is judgment has emotional attachment observation is neutral you may be an observer of this and say ah this is their lesson but if it is a judgment it's I must change it it's wrong do you see yes and we could apply that to uh, other ways of dealing with things as well couldn't we correct to be more observant of it and not to judge the other or the, whatever the situation may be. But it is also educational in the sense of the judgment to see what inside of you is judging or whom inside is judging, what part of self. Oh yes, because when you judge another, you're judging yourself. Correct. Right, but when you observe another, you're just maybe even observing yourself. It's an observation of, isn't that interesting? It's an observation of the human condition, possibly. Oh, that's a cool way of putting it, yeah. Right. Yes. And they can be funny, those human conditions, can't they? We find them hilarious at times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, some of those conditions are there because we, that's just part of the human nature, or is it part? No, it must be part of the soul growth. It is. Understand this. Many speak about young, adolescent, mature and old souls, yes? And that is true. But what is spoken about is only the human experience that soul has had. And so there are younger souls and adolescent souls. It doesn't speak to the entirety of the soul, the over soul or the whole soul, but in the experience of human expression. So there are some who've had many, many lifetimes and have learned from those lifetimes how to interact as a human being in a conscious state, an aware state. And then there are the younger ones that are just 
trying it out. And the greater lesson in the human experience is the learning of emotions. Yes, that comes to me time and time again, that. And emotions in the sense of learning to experience them and learning for them not to take control of you? Or... Yes. But many people judge the emotions are good, bad, or, and ultimately they are just experiential ways of discernment, isn't it, and protection. And your body is, the emotion is the, the response of the mind to the feeling. Yes? Yeah. The mind discerns what its reactivity to the visceral feeling of the physical body. Whether it would be anger or fear or joy or happiness or ecstasy or whatever one might speak of it as. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and, and, I, and I suppose for the soul, um, I, I always think to myself, well, was there nothing better to do on a, on a Saturday night than to come here sometimes, right? Um, why do, so, so is one of the main reasons why we incarnate here is, is to learn to master our emotions. It is emotions, but it's also, isn't it exquisite to have a physical structure, your earth suit, to navigate this planet, but it's also to feel those feelings. To touch and be touched, yes? Yeah. But without the body, you could not have those experiences. To feel the visceral experience of emotion. But then, you know, because we have the human experience, it's almost like it's a double-edged sword where we forget our connection to where we came from. We get a, forget our connection to you, to ourselves, of the true nature of that we're consciousness, my human words are it consciousness having a human experience so it, we we come here and we forget who we are um, but we, we some of us are waking up that we are more than our body yes and that's our teaching hmm. now is the time in this fifth dimensionary energy is to recognize that you're more than your physical body your soul is much larger than you can possibly imagine and more powerful. So what we speak of is this is a time of the recognition of the divine essence that you are, the master being that you are, not from a sense of controlling others, but in that true sense of atonement and soul connectivity. What, what happens to a human's life when they get more in contact with their soul connectivity? How much can they shift in a sense? Tremendously and their life shifts as well. For their coming, they've up-leveled, if you would, how they view their lives. So the lenses in which they see their life through changes, their perceptivity changes. And so in turn, what happens in their external life, that what is drawn unto them changes as well. Yes. And then they start to learn as well that we can manifest the life that we want. Correct. But the law of attraction I'm learning on this journey is not quite the way it's being taught in some respects. That's true. It's because it's a different perception, you see. The law of attraction is always working. Mm -hmm. It's always working. It's like electricity everywhere. The reason you know electricity works is you turn on the light. And if it's not on, you know there's an interruption somewhere. But it's been all around you all along, still is. The law of attraction, the quantum field, the energy of that is permeating everything. And so people think it's not working for them, but what they think most about is what they're getting. And it's working perfectly. Because the quantum field or the universal energy or, or the, uh, the law of attraction, if you will, is just energy. It all works with what you think most about and what you believe about yourself. Because there has to be believability and receptivity for it to work in the way that most people desire it's working. Yes? But what do you think most about? 
And when you think in terms of that, it's usually what you're getting in your life, what you're drawing onto yourself. So to say it's not working is incorrect. It seems so easy, doesn't it, <laughs> from that perspective? The words are easy, action is, is and beliefs as well. It is <clears throat> to shift beliefs, limiting beliefs, can be difficult. The words are easy. The words we speak are very easy, but action is difficult. Yes, because there's emotion attached to the experiences. And some beliefs are very hard put and ingrained. Yes? Yes, absolutely. And, and how does the law of attraction fit into the multidimensional reality that we exist in as well? Again, it's just energy, isn't it? Energy does not discern whether you're thinking a positive or a negative thought. It just reacts to whatever the thought is. It's an energy alignment. Do you see? I, I do, I do. So, as, as we shift our um, law of attraction thoughts, so as we shift our thoughts on what, what it is we're trying to attract into our life, whatever it may be, yes. right? Are we continuously then shifting to, is, is the consciousness shifting to different realities in a sense, till it gets to the reality that we, we so forth choose, or we so forth, uh, it, the reality that's maybe the best for us in a sense? Yes, it's up-leveling your, your knowing, isn't it? When we say you're, you're seeing through your life through certain lenses, Yes. If you shift the lens just a little bit, you'll see life differently. And life will respond differently. With the, in regards to the multi-dimensions or the multi-universe, um, are there... There's not just this reality, is there? No. You're a multi-dimensional being. Understand this, many speak of lifetime, birth to death. What we speak of is birth to birth. The soul births into this physical identity, which you call a body, and it lives a certain number of years in, encased in this physical structure, navigating the earthly plane. Mm -hmm. And then when that's complete, the energy of the soul births it again into its multidimensional state. So it doesn't end. Energy is constant, only form changes. But are we constantly, do you think, as we create, as we shift our perception of what it is in life that we want, are we constantly maybe shifting into other realities? Of course, that's perception, isn't it? That's perception through the idea that you said with the lens. Yes. But we would be unaware of the shifts, in a sense, except for we're getting to more of a life that we wish to desire. That we're... Yes, and then there are moments where there's realization of that, where I'm not reacting to life as I did in the past. You're different, but it can be very subtle and not realized until one moment something happens and you see you're seeing life through different lenses because you're not reactive you're responsive mm. there's a difference to that yes i mean i mean the way i've seen it on this journey which, which is maybe it's just my own perception of it is that um i don't know why i i keep going on about this but it's i think it it's to know this, that as we shift through different realities or different, different lenses, different perceptions of this reality, as we're shifting towards the truth that we want or something we wish to pull into our life, um, that also shows us just how powerful we are and just that it's not instantaneous. It, you, there, there's a sort of queuing time. There's a sort of, you know, going from this perspective to that perspective to that perspective. Yes. And then a perspective that meets us to where we need to be will, will arrive in a sense. Correct. 
I wish I could say it more e elegantly than that. <laughs> we are aware of what you're saying, but if you think in terms of an ocean liner and how long it takes for the ship to turn, truly it takes quite a, a distance before a ship can turn in a different direction. So that could be an analogy you could use, yes? Mm -hmm. The ship is still turning, isn't it? Because the captain has, has turned the wheel, but because of the momentum and the strength, it takes a bit of time for the massive movement. It's not an instant right-hand turn, for an example. Yes? Yes. And that is how you can think in terms of as perception shift, you're, you're turning the ship. But then present moment is also very important, isn't it? Very much so. Because you're not living your life if you're not in the present, are you? If you're too far into the future, you're into the what-ifs and oftentimes fear. And if you're in the past, there are ruminations of what you could have done differently or or maybe there's anger or whatever might be happening. And so if you're in either place, you're not in the present, are you? N no. And how do you stay in the present when there is something that you wish to attract in your life that's not there now? So you place that intention and then you pay attention to what is happening now for that energy to evolve to your present state of awareness that it's here. Yes? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. Right. Okay. But that, that is uh, not so easy for some of us. It's true, because in, if it's not immediate, because instant gratification is something humans like very much, so if it's not immediate, then the mind goes, it's not happening, it's never happening, I can't have it, I'm not worthy of it, whatever the mind goes to in a negative sense of belief, rather than allowing the evolution and watching for the signs because you always have them, that you're on the right direction. So no matter where our life is now, we have the power to make changes if we so wish to do so and we've sort of looked at the negative beliefs as well. If you look at the beliefs that are limiting, we're not going to call them negative or positive, okay. they're limiting. Okay. Yes, if you look at those limiting beliefs and where they've come from, they can be changed. Events will not be changed, that's history. But how you perceive them and how you move forward from it can change. What about those people, and I think you've dealt with this, we're dealing with this work now, but the people that um, get a bit addicted to saying, you know, I am the way I am because of my past lives. They're stuck. That was then, this is now. And when they put the I am in front of it, it gives it more power, doesn't it? The I am is the God that you are. So they're affirming and confirming for themselves that that's true. Would it, would if all lives are happening now, would you say that may be true? We say there's the energy that is all happening now in the multidimensional phase, yes. So are, are those past and future lives affecting this present moment? They are in the sense of, we say that the soul is like a diamond with many facets. And what gives the diamond its brilliance is the refracting light as it hits, it gives the sparkle, doesn't it? Hmm. So we would liken lifetimes to those facets. And when you are incarnated, there are certain ones of those facets that are influential in the present. For whatever has happened, it doesn't mean you have to adhere to that, but you learn from, and now you're in the experience of the recognition and the wisdom that was gained from those moments. But to not get lost in saying, well, you know, I've got to heal that past life issue in this life now. It's an excuse. Yes, healing it, it's not healing it because the events aren't going to change. The events happen, they're history, yes? What changes is your vision of it. And what is the gift, the learning that was obtained from those events? Because no matter what happens, there's always a gift and a blessing, no matter what it is. 
And that's learning, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. What, what is some of your main teachings right now that you're trying to bring through to this planet? We're teaching about the soul integrational process, the recognition of these fragmented aspects, these, mm -hmm, these places where the light is shining, that we draw forward from those experiences and create a life in the present so we can resolve that and get the fuller understanding of who we are. So what we're teaching is how to shift those limiting beliefs, whether past or in the present. They can be both. But usually a carryover of a belief about self is the thing that is created in the present for that realization to come forth. And then the belief to be changed. The beliefs that are changed are about who you are and your worthiness and recognizing that you are a divine master being, having a human experience and you deserve to have the life you wish to live. But can a, a, soul, a soul that's ready to hear your message uh, as a calling to wake them up, they have to be at the right place though because you know, if we took this message to other countries where life circumstances are different and they're yes. just, you know, mouth to mouth, day to day. Yes. It could resonate very differently. It would. So we would give them different words for the understanding. And know that those we speak to now can have a reference to what we're speaking about or they wouldn't even listen. They wouldn't even be attracted to our message. Yes. But there are some in those countries from which you speak that are awake. Oh yes. And know this message. And they will be way showers and leaders to bring those to their awakening. Have I spoken to you before? Not in person. Because uh, I just wonder if this is the same energy that's, if everything is one, is, is there a connection in the energy that I've met with others and yours? There is connectivity, of course. Hmm. That's a hard one, isn't it? Everything is one, really, but everything is so separate. It is hard to get the mind around, yes? Yes. Yes. And, and so where, where you're coming from, is this, this is out of time, out of our understanding of, 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 of the human mind? No, there are 12 dimensions about the earth. We connect to all 12 of them. You're now in the fifth, which is this awakening time. The third was your physical reality, the fourth, a spiritual awakening. Now the fifth, the, the ability to realize mastery. And the sixth will be experienced in physical as well, and that will be full mastery. That's when you have peace on your planet. But the others are experienced in hmm, their context of energy, but not physically. So we speak from all those dimensions. If I was to cross over, which I don't think my time's just yet, right? But when I do, would I be creating a reality that's as real as this? Of course. Then how would I know this is not the spirit world compared to what the world is which we talk about of being this, you know, the real world? How do you know, how would you differentiate the difference then? Is it different? Energy is constant, only form changes. And because you're in a physical form, that is why you think it's different. I always had the feeling recently that I was asking the questions, have I crossed over already? And then I say to myself, that's the most insane question to ask yourself. But Not really, because you are that soul that is existing for all time. So if I'm existing all time, there's a part of me that's already crossed over. Yes, you're in touch with all of it. What if we were to get more in touch with that part? Would it be a more wiser part for us to speak to that's already had this experience? That's your future self, isn't it? 
that has lived this moment, and yes, you can be in contact with that. The future self, that, and it, it, could that be a future self that's multifaceted, that, that's multidimensional, that sees... Of course. But there are times when that would be too much for the human mind to contain. Then why am I asking the question if it was too much? For the concept is comfortable, but the actual experience of it might be a bit off-putting. I see. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, it, uh, w w but it's available to us. Yes. As a tool. It can be for those that can keep it in context. There are those that have touched that, that have the inability to stay balanced. I guess maybe it's been knocking on my door. I don't know, why would I be th considering it in the first place? Because you have the awareness in the fifth dimension of all possibility. Which is where we are now. Correct. When people talked about a new earth, that was a language that was going around before, I always felt that that wasn't quite the picture. It wasn't quite right. It, there was some truth in it, but it was more than that. The earth is going to stay the same longer than you'll be alive in this body. However, perception is changing to a broader scope. And that's the new world, if you would. A greater understanding beyond what has been understood before. So if my future self exists, or there's an aspect of me that's already done all, done all this, we've already had this communication. Yes. And are we doing it in a different way this time? Not really. How many times have we done this? Many. Each time you have a new question, it's a new time, isn't it? Yes, absolutely it is. I would not have asked these same questions before. But I wonder if I was getting close to the same questioning before and just looking for the same thing. You're very curious. And yes, and it keeps expanding. I, throughout this documentary, what's been coming through me is it just sounds so crazy saying this, but it's, it's the truth. I feel like I've done this before. It's almost like that movie Groundhog Day, where he keeps coming back until he's realized how to love truly himself as much as anyone else. Interesting concept, isn't it? Yes. How these things get fed into movies sometimes, yet there's so much truth in them. Yes. That's how the message gets out many times. So it's not forced upon us, though, this is the truth, but here's an option. Correct. And it gives the mind the opportunity to consider possibilities that it may not have considered previously. But by knowing I've done this before many times in different ways, it, what it makes me feel is live it to the max right now with love for everyone else and yourself, but just live a life to the max that you really want to do the things that you want to do. Of course. It doesn't make me feel lazy to think that just because, because we've done this before that, you know, oh, there's loads of chances to do it again. It, I think it makes me feel the reverse. I hope it does. Good. It should. What, what's the progression of other people hearing this information? Some will be confused. Some will be inspired. Some, it may trigger them to be reactive, but that's good, isn't it? Because if it is provocative enough, they may open to grow and to ask the questions as you have, to find the answers for themselves. And to go deeper than they've gone before. Yes. That would be my only wish. I'm not trying to do this to mess people's minds up or to, to talk about things that are of no use. I'm trying to open up to where we've gone before. I'm trying to go deeper in the unknown than if we have done this before. Let's go deeper than where we got before. And does that help us? I find it brings us back to present moment more. It does. But it also brings one back to the knowing of who they are. And that essence of who they are is that divine being, the master. 
the master. That's so important what you're saying there. The master, this multidimensional facet, it's so much bigger than we've ever been told in any book. And we're so much greater than what we realize. Do, 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 for us to progress in this way and ask those deeper questions as we do, does that progress you? Of course. The learning is never only for one. And one is not greater than another. No, no, that's, that's come through a number of times, Ash. Thank you for that. Um, okay, well, if there's any last message you might like to give, we're, we're, thank you. We wish all will recognize their mastery. For if you could see yourselves as we see you, there would be no discontent, only love. Guru